video games have changed forever. And I don't mean just graphically either. The entire business of the gaming industry has been turned on its head, all because of one little change to the economic model microtransactions. You would be hard-pressed to find a title that isn't beginning to shift their main monetary strategy to one based around microtransactions. Gamers tend to hate it. It makes the players feel like they're being sucked dry of their pennies each time they open the game. Somehow, though, these companies are managing to rake in record earnings year after year. But how can that be? If a majority of gaming communities are all upset with the current state of monetization, how can they be doing better than ever? Well, that's what we'll be exploring in this video. First, we need to go back to understand the foundation of microtransactions in games as we know them today. The first major example of a microtransaction that most people point to is in 2006, when Bethesda decided to allow a piece of horse armor for the Elder Scrolls to be purchased for $2.49. Before that, DLC was around which some would also classify as a microtransaction. However, for the purposes of this video, we'll be focusing on skins and aesthetics companies used to make a killing. This first horse skin that was available for purchase ended up becoming the ninth most popular DLC content for Oblivion, and it made a considerable profit. There was a large portion of the community that had become upset about its introduction, but the thing people tend to gloss over is that most microtransactions aren't made for the overall community. Rather, their focus is to super-monetize their most die-hard players. So while, sure, the players who only dabbled in Oblivion found the $2.49 for the horse skin stupid, players who love the game bought it up. In business, there are two types of markets you can sell to cold and warm. A cold lead is the equivalent of trying to convince someone who's never heard of your game to spend $60 on it and then purchase a cosmetic horse skin. That's a difficult sale. However, if someone's already spending all of their waking hours huddled over your game, that sale becomes drastically easier. This is one of the psychological pillars that microtransactions can play on. The idea of sunken cost Sure, you did pay $60 for the game originally, but since you've been spending so much time on it recently, it couldn't hurt that bad to spend some extra money, right? I mean, after all, it's only fair since you spend so much time playing. This model, honestly, is relatively fair. The game presents a purely aesthetic item for you to purchase or not. It does take advantage of their most loyal fans' time spent on the game, but at the end of the day, that's any brand with their top customers. Things really took an insane turn in 2008, when iPhone gaming really burst onto the scene. These games really took a free-to-play model and managed to make billions off of microtransactions by using people's impulse control against them. The game Angry Birds, for example, has managed to make $286 million in 2022 so far while being entirely free-to-play. Their play is simple, offer a free, watered-down version of the actual game that's just fun enough to get people to install and get slightly hooked. Then, dangle a carrot in front of their face and say you could X many more birds for $2.99 or one-time limited new player pack $5.99. If you've already shown them a good time with the free version and then imply there's a chance they could enjoy the game more or even better, miss out on enjoying the game fully, then there's a strong chance they'll make a purchase. Many games have taken this FOMO model and really implemented it. Think about how many games will release skins or DLC just for a holiday or event. They really promote that this is the only time to make this purchase, so you need to do it right now. That false sense of urgency drastically increases both the number of people who purchase and the average amount spent per person. One of the most popular forms of microtransactions in the current age is loot boxes. This was originally a way to let players take a chance to unlock different variations of items in MMORPGs. However, it quickly devolved into the borderline gambling we know today. It originated in MapleStory in Japan. It was an innocent way to randomly get items for your character for 100 yen or 77 cents. It didn't provide any real in-game advantages. It was just something for cosmetics. This really changed on its heads when game developers realized they could put pay-to-win items in these boxes. It basically meant that in order to be competitive at the highest level, you would be heavily encouraged to pour money into the game. Sure, in theory, you didn't need to buy a loot box to get the special blueprint for the best gun in the game, but if you don't like being wrecked over and over, you'll start to consider it. Many games take this approach with some of the most prominent being Call of Duty, where your weapon variants can make quite a large difference. 
especially during Call of Duty Advanced Warfare. There was a certain weapon called the Bow 27 Obsidian Steep that granted increased damage and reduced ADS time. This meant that it was literally better than every other Bow 27 in the game. Sure, you could get it through grinding for free loot boxes, or you could just buy loot boxes and expedite the process. Loot boxes are exceptionally deceptive because there's literally no guarantee you're getting the item you truly want. Another trick studios use to get you to spend more in-game is by converting real money into an in-game currency. This has two effects. The first is that you don't really tend to take spending the fake money too seriously. Once you put that money in and it turns into Call of Duty points, there really is no way to reverse it, so it becomes money spent in your mind. The second is that the way they usually convert is in a way to disguise sticker shock. Think about it. If the next Call of Duty skin came out and asked for $18.99, people would probably have a much stronger aversion than spending 18,000 COD points, especially if it's someone who always has COD points on their account and doesn't have to think about it too much. When you have an absurd amount of in-game currency, there's a good chance that you'll spend it faster than if you had to really make that $19 transaction every single time. This overall leads you to spend more money. Some games have even managed to create a system where players will pay for items with a time expiration, which is baffling. You hand over money to be able to temporarily use an item in the game you enjoy. It's the equivalent of renting an item in-game. The games that are most prominent with this are War Thunder, whose boosts expire after a certain amount of time not using them. You can purchase this in exchange for real money, but you better use them in a timely fashion. So, if all of these games have devised pretty unpopular ways to monetize their games, how is it still generating a profit? After all, most gamers have become sour to the over-monetization on most of these titles. As we said earlier in the video, this boils down to who is truly spending the most on these games, which are the die-hard fans. For example, when looking at a game that's really mastered this microtransaction model like Fortnite, one thing is apparent. Players will spend more on microtransactions overall than they will on a game. Their average player spends $85, which is well above the $60 standard for most games. This alone would be insane, but when compared to how much their whales are spending, it's peanuts. The total cost of all skins in Fortnite would be over $7,900 which is a far cry from $85. I don't believe that many players have every skin in the game, but think about all of the streamers and pro players that have even half. If you can convert your top 1% of spenders from $85 to near $3,500, it's an absolute game changer in your bottom line. Let's say, for example's sake, that the top 1% of Fortnite spenders only spend $170 on the game, or just double the average player. That would mean Fortnite is raking in over $600 million from those players alone. Considering the game generated $5 billion, that means that 12% of their overall revenue comes just from the top 1% of players alone. Chances are, their top 1% is spending well over just double what the average player does. Essentially, microtransactions allow games to focus on the wealthy, addicted players who are willing to spend money on the game no matter what. It's a lot less about having everyone spending $2 on one skin versus having a die-hard fanbase that'll buy every skin in the game. They have all the little tricks in the book to get you hooked whether it be selling you items to make you better at the game or playing off of your false sense of urgency. Microtransactions are made to separate you from as much money as humanly possible. In 2021, Activision, one of the largest publishers in the world, was hit with accusations that they purposefully put players into easier lobbies after they would make a microtransaction purchase. These game companies are going above and beyond to try to convince you that every purchase you make is a positive, and by rewarding you with dopamine from a good game after making a purchase, they're directly building a positive feedback loop with your brain. No matter the case, microtransactions are most likely here to stay. The studios are making an enormous profit with this model, even though it seems that the average gamer is becoming much more aware of this and seems to be becoming discontent with the model. Until they stop rolling around in their profits, there's almost no chance that they'll stop doing something so incredibly lucrative and profitable. If you enjoyed this video, you can check out the one on screen now, and remember to subscribe if you enjoy content about business, finance, and the video game industry.